Welcome back to our deep learning lecture. We are now in part four of the introduction and here we want to talk about machine learning, pattern recognition and we want to give a short introduction in all the terminology, notation and what you will need over the scope of the next couple of videos. Recursive self-improvement, um, that is really the pinnacle of that where you then not only learn uh, how to improve on that problem and on that, but you also improve the way the machine improves and you also improve the way it improves the way it improves itself. And that was my 1987 diploma thesis, which was all about that. So throughout this entire lecture series, we will use a following notation. Matrices are bold and uppercase. So examples here are M and A. Vectors are bold and lowercase. Examples here are V and X. Scalars are italic and lowercase. Y, W, alpha. For the gradient of a function, we use the gradient symbol. For partial derivatives, we use the partial notation. Furthermore, we have some specifics about deep learning. So the trainable weights will be generally called W. Features or inputs are X. These are typically vectors. Then we have the ground truth label, which is Y. We have some estimated output that is Y hat. And if we have some iterations going on, we typically do that in superscript and put it into brackets. This is an iteration index here, iteration i for variable x. Of course, this is a very coarse notation and we will develop it further throughout the lecture. If you have attended previous lectures of our group, then you should know the classical image processing pipeline of pattern recognition. It does recording with sampling followed by analog to digital conversion. Then you have the pre-processing feature extraction followed by classification. Of course, in the classification step, you have to do the training. The first part of the pattern recognition pipeline is covered in our lecture introduction to pattern recognition. The main part of classification is then covered in pattern recognition. Now, what you see in this image is a classical image recognition problem. Let's say you want to differentiate apples from pears. Now, one idea that you could do is you could draw a circle around them and then measure the length of the major and minor axis. So you will recognize that apples are round and pears are longer. So the ellipses have a different in major and minor axis. Now you could take those two numbers and represent them as a vector value in a vector space representation. Which is basically a vector space representation summing up uh, the input from all sensors. Th that does, does not show any pictures. You then enter a two-dimensional space in which you will find that all of the apples are located on the diagonal through the x-axis. If the diameter in one direction increases, also the diameter in the other direction increases. Your pairs are off this straight line because they have a difference in minor and major axis. Now you will find that a line is able to separate those two and you can essentially consider this as your first classification system. Of the world in vector space. Um, but I think this is very difficult for people to, normal people to understand. They would not know what the heck they're looking at. Now, what many people think about how the big data processing works is shown in the small figure. So this is your machine learning system. Yep, pour the data in this big pile of linear algebra and then collect the answers on the other side. And what if the answers are wrong? Just stir the pile until they start looking right. So you can see in this picture is that, of course, this is how many people think that they approach deep learning. 
you just pour the data in and in the end you just stir a bit and then you get the right results. Ooh, AI. That's actually not how it works. Remind them what you want to do is you want to build a system that learns a classification. That means from your measurement you first have to do some pre-processing like reduce noise, then you have to get a meaningful image, then do feature extraction and from that you can do a classification. Now the difference to deep learning is that you put everything into a single kind of engine. So this does pre-processing, feature extraction and the classification just in a single step. You just use the training data and the measurements in order to produce those systems. Now this has been shown to work in a lot of applications. But as we've already talked about in the last lecture, you have to have the right data. Which means that we have 99% we have of all the data. You cannot just pour in some data and then stir until it starts looking right. You have to have a proper data set, proper data collection, and if you don't do that in an appropriate way, you just get nonsense. And we will look into all the different threats that can occur in later parts of this lecture. So, of course, we have a couple of postulates, and those postulates also apply in the regime of deep learning. So, in classical pattern recognition, we are following these postulates. So, the first postulate is that there is a variability of representative sampling patterns, and those sampling patterns are given in the class and the problem domain omega. Here you have training examples for all those classes and they are representative. So it means that if you have a new observation, it will be similar to those patterns that you already collected. And the next postulate is that there is a simple pattern and the simple pattern has features that characterizes the membership to a certain class. So you have to be somehow be able to process the data and to derive this abstract representation. With this representation, you can then build the class in the classifier. Furthermore, features of the same class should be compact in the feature domain. So this means that features of different classes, they should be apart from other classes, while features of the same class should be close to each other. So what you want to have ideally are small interclass variances and high interclass distances. Examples are shown here in this figure. So on the top left you see one that is nice and easy. The one on the center is also solvable. It gets harder for the third one and of course you can still separate them by a nonlinear boundary. More complicated is the case on the bottom left because here the classes are intermixed and you want essentially to draw regions around those classes. They may be very intertwined, but if they're still separable, then of course you can find a solution. It might be very hard to figure out which part goes where. If you have a situation like on the bottom right, you don't have a very good feature representation and you want to think whether you don't find better features. What many people do today is they just say, oh, let's go to deep learning and just learn an appropriate representation that then will do the trick. A complex pattern consists of simpler constituents that have a certain relation to each other and the pattern may be decomposed into those parts. Furthermore, a complex pattern has a certain structure and not every arrangement of simpler parts gives a valid pattern. Many patterns can be represented with relatively few parts. Of course, two patterns are similar if the features of simpler parts only differ slightly. Having seen those basic postulates of pattern recognition,
we will see that many of them still apply also in the world of deep learning. However, we don't really see how things are decomposed. Instead, we build systems that gradually simplify the input such that you decompose them into parts in order to get a better representation. Now let's start with the very basics. The perceptron is the basic unit that you will find in most neural networks. They are inspired by biology. Actually, they have been introduced by Rosenblatt in the 1950s, and people really got excited because of this biological relation. Now, but it's all going to happen. I mean, we are going to get to human level intelligence or whatever you want, what you will, um, artificial general intelligence at some point. Now, a biological neuron is connected by synapses to other neurons and computes the sum of incoming excitatory and inhibitory activations. If they are large enough, then the neuron is firing, and it's firing if you have a certain potential that is over a threshold. Then it's transmitting information, and it's typically an all or none response, which means that if you have a higher stimulus and you exceed the threshold, it doesn't mean that it causes a higher response. It either fires or doesn't fire. So it's essentially a binary classifier. This concept can rather easily be transformed into vector representation. Rosenblatt essentially devised a system that takes an input vector that is specified here by input values x1 to xn, and you add some bias 1. Here you multiply them with weights and add them up. Then you have an activation function that either fires or doesn't. And for the sake of simplicity, we can simply take the sine function. So if you have a positive activation, you fire. If you have a negative activation, you don't fire. So this could be represented by the sine function. And this leads to a rather problematic training procedure. Of course, if you want to train, you need to have tuples of observations of the respective classes. This is then your training data set, and then you need to determine the set M of misclassified feature vectors. So these are the vectors where the predicted number Y does not match the actual class membership Yi if you compute the output of the neuron. Now, if you have this set M, that has to be determined after each step of the training iterations, then you try to minimize the following optimization problem. The problem that describes your misclassification is essentially the sum over all your misclassified samples, where you compute the output of your actual neuron. This is then multiplied by the true class membership. Given the minus one, one encoding, if the two don't match, it must be a negative value. Then if you multiply above term with minus one, you create a high value for a lot of misclassifications. So the goal is to minimize this term. This then essentially leads to an optimization procedure where you have iterative updates. This optimization then has to determine an updated gradient step for the weights. Once you update the weights, you have to determine the set of misclassified vectors again. Now, the problem with this is that in every iteration, the cardinality of the composition of M may change because with every step, you may have more of your misclassifications. You actually compute the gradient of the function with respect to the weights, and it's simply the input vector multiplied with the correct class minus one. This will then give you the update on the weights. Now, if you calculated this gradient, strategy one would be processing of all the samples and then perform the weight update. Strategy two is to take an update step after each misclassified sample and then directly update the weights. So you can get an update rule for each iteration, which then simplifies to the old weights plus the misclassified multiplied with 
the class membership. This then gives you the new weights. Now you optimize until convergence for a predefined number of iterations. This very simple procedure has a number of disadvantages, which we will have a look at at a later point in this class. Because it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so next time in this lecture, we want to look at a couple of organizational matters that will be important if you want to obtain the certificate for this course. Furthermore, we want to look into a short summary of the four videos so far. And yeah, I hope you also like this video and looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye-bye.